I'm Connor. I'm Jeff. I'm James. And I'm Daniel. And the August What's Knee starts right now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. Isn't that awful? You're sitting there doing a perfect run by and the train stops on the switch points and the sound stops and your light stops. It's exactly what we don't want. And it's a simple cure. When I run my layout, I usually run it about every week or so and my switch points tend to get really dirty. And that's exactly what has just happened here in this situation. I'm running across a switch and the switch points are in fact all gummed up with oil, which causes the sound to drop out and the lights to flicker. I like to cure this by using a simple diamond file, and I generally just take the diamond file and I file the switch points clean by just working the diamond file carefully. You don't want to file away too much because you don't want your switches to get thin over time, but just keep your switches clean with a diamond file and then take a little bit of rail zip and put rail zip in between the points and that'll ensure the fact that as time goes by and you don't run your layout that often, odds are good your switch points will stay clean. And so with that, this is August 2020, What's Neat? And in this month's video, we're gonna have some great drone footage from Stephen M. Conroy, modeling ideas from above. There's nothing better making your layout look great than to look at drone footage and use the visuals as examples on how to make your layout look good. We also have a really neat layout tour with Campbell Rice this month. Campbell has just finished building his new layout. He's got about almost seven or eight months into construction and it's amazing how fast the layout construction got finished. And in this video, we're gonna have an expose of all of his work up to this point. Also in this month's video, I do a segment on decoder installation. I install simple non-sound decoders into locomotives, eight pin, nine pin, and 21 pin decoders. And so that's the lineup for this August 2020, What's Neat? For this segment of What's Neat, being locked down here in Missouri with this COVID going on, I found plenty of time to get some projects done that I generally always like to put off. And today I'm installing decoders, non-sound decoders into DCC ready locomotives. I've got some Athern SD50s here, some wonderful Missouri Pacific Canaries, and I've got a GP38-2 that I've just actually remove the couplers on. And what I'm installing today are two types of decoders, 21 pin decoders and nine pin decoders, which actually are adaptable also for the eight pin installation. And I'm gonna explain that in great detail. First of all, for the 21 pin decoders, I'm installing these um, NCE D16 MTC decoders into this SD70 ACE locomotive. In the last four years, a lot of manufacturers have gone over to the 21 pin decoder because it allows more functions and more lighting effects on the locomotives. Prior to that, for the past 10 or 15 years, generally it's an eight or 10 pin 
our eight or nine pin decoder installation, which I've got both types of decoders here. This Digitrax decoder is a DH12, uh, DH126PS decoder, which I've been using in my locomotives for years. And of course, these are non-sound decoders that are used in DCC-ready locomotives. And what do I mean by that? What does that term DCC-ready mean? Generally, it means that they've already got a motherboard in the locomotive, as you see right here, that's got either your choice of an eight pin plug-in area or, of course, the nine pin plug-in area. And let me explain further what that means. This Digitrax decoder, the DH-126 decoder, as you see, the decoder itself is what's wrapped in this blue plastic right here. And then there's the harness cable that also comes with it. The harness cable on the end of the harness is an 8-pin plug, which is the standard for the 8-pin decoder installation. But yet this is a 9-pin decoder which plugs into the harness. So if I'm doing an 8-pin installation, I simply plug this into the locomotive and then plug this directly, this harness directly into the decoder and I'm ready to rock and roll. But if I, a lot of manufacturers also allow the option of simply plugging the 9-pin decoder directly into the locomotive. And on this Atherin unit, it gives you a choice of both types of installations. You simply pull off this motherboard that's already on, on here, this pin, this plug, and then I would plug the Digitrax decoder directly into that and this locomotive would then be ready to go. For the 21 pin installation on this SD70 ACE demonstrator locomotive right here, the way I went about that was first I removed the coupler boxes on each end of the locomotive. Those actually hold the shell into place. But on the SD70 ACE, there's also two additional screws that you remove on either end of the fuel tank. So I pulled out each one of these screws, which are right next to the fuel tank shell. Reve once that's done, you can successfully remove the shell of the locomotive, pull it right off, which reveals the 21 pin removable circuit board, which then I unplugged and then I plug the NCE decoder directly into that the 21 pin decoder, just push it right into place and it plugs right in and the motherboard and the locomotive is pretty much ready to go. At that point, it's then time to put the shell back onto the locomotive, carefully pressing all of the wires in place, making sure you don't pinch any of the wires. And then once the shell's on the locomotive, again, I'm using a cradle to do this. And I want to show you this, for example. I like to put these in a locomotive cradle. I've got this uh, GP38-2 in a cradle. And this is simply a wooden structure design that I built to hold the locomotive so that you can get to it from underneath to remove the coupler boxes and the screws. I also like to put a piece of sponge sometimes in the cradle so that when the locomotive is laying directly on top, the top of the hood unit is laying there, I don't break off any firecracker antennas or any of the exhaust stacks. Going back to this SD70 Ace once again, once I had the shell put back onto the locomotive, it was then time to put the screws back in on each side of the fuel tank, which holds the shell into place, and then put the couplers back into place. Now at this point you have your choice of couplers and in this case what I like to do in my layout because my track work isn't that perfect all the time I like to use KD number no. 5 couplers. I keep them in a storage container here which is keeps them all separate from each other whether it is KD number no. 58's that you like to use the number fives, I keep the springs and the boxes all in compartments and of course I've got upper shelf, lower shelf and a couple of long shank type couplers that I keep stored in this container. In order to put the couplers back into the box, one thing I like to do ahead of time is to actually glue the coupler box together. As you see here, I just simply take some uh, cement, some liquid glue cement that slowly um, eats away at the plastic and allows me to glue the coupler box back together prior to installation. This just makes installation much easier in the locomotive. And then of course after you've got your coupler boxes pushed back into the locomotive pockets, then you put the screw back in. One thing that helps facilitate installation of the coupler boxes and the screws is a screwdriver that's magnetized. Now what do I mean by that? Here I've got this Phillips screwdriver here that's used for most of the screws on this locomotive project. And a magnetizer is something simple you can get at any hardware store. It's got a plus and a minus side, so it'll magnetize or demagnetize the screwdriver. Then simply run the screwdriver through this area just like this. And what it does is it magnetizes the screwdriver so that the screws, as you attach them to it, stay attached. 
This makes pulling the screws out of the coupler boxes much easier and installation much easier than trying to fumble around with your fingers and put the screw and the screwdriver into place all at the same time. So that's just a couple of tips, something that I'm going through while I'm sitting here at home doing lots of different projects. And that's this segment of coupler installation and decoder installation for What's Neat.
for this segment of What's Neat. I'm standing here with Campbell Rice. You'll recall the last time we saw this beautiful layout was when it was just under construction and it ran in the maze, What's Neat. And Campbell, you had this thing just getting put together because you had just moved into this beautiful new basement. Okay. And now you've got this thing that runs all the way around the room and a lot of the scenery's finished on it. Um, Tell me about this layout. You, you built this relatively quickly. How long did it take to actually get to the point where you're at? Well, let's see, I started in September of uh, 2019 when we moved into this house. So um, kind of worked on it through the winter. And you know, here we are today in, uh, in June of 2020. And uh, so a, a lot of it was already done in my previous house. So I kind of moved it in and, and assembled it here. And then, of course, this is a lot larger space. Before it was 30 feet, and in here I'm a little over 50 feet. So I've had to actually do a lot of expansion. So a lot of what's done scenery-wise was done before I moved it, and the module was basically removed from that place and, and set in place here. And I've just kind of integrated that into the new part. What kind of scenery base did you use? How, what's your scenery made of? It's, it's styrofoam, double stacked, so four inches of styrofoam on basically one by four and, uh, and two by two legs. And then uh, the, the skirt around it, uh, but uh, that's what it's, basically that's what I do. It's just all light work, lightweight and it's easy to work with. Right, it appears you've modeled sort of the Midwest. You say that we're standing in front of Campbellsville here. <laughs> Step back and, and I'll yes. get some B-roll of this, but this is, this is an example of the type of scenery you like to do where you like different levels. You've got the streets below the tracks, right. the tracks come through the town a little higher up, and it really gives a neat perspective for the buildings. Tell us about why you designed it like this. Well, it was, it was kind of a last minute deal. Um, back this way is the, uh, the yard and I needed a, a, a track to work freight cars in and out of and if it would have been street level then there would have been a road blocking issue so I decided what I would do was uh, would do is to elevate the main line through town and uh, this was kind of uh, done um, kind of if you if you've ever been to Nashville there's an upper line like this that runs all the way through the city so I thought I would elevate the main line and and the siding here so that way it allows traffic to free flow in and out through town without causing any congestion. So that's kind of where all that idea came from. And it appears the way you've designed this, and I'm going to show this, we're going to walk around and look at the different areas of, mm -hmm. your, of your layout that are semi-finished. You've built scenes and then there's trackage where there's, there's farmland and there's just, you feel like you're going somewhere from location to location. Yeah, that, that was pretty much the idea and, and it's, it's a, uh, um, I always like to have a purpose for the railroad, not just something to turn, or turn on and just let it run. However, I can do that if I, if I want to, but um, I, I semi get into operations, nothing real technical with cards and all that. I, I just kind of use my imagination and say, well, all right, I want these cars to go here and these cars to go here. Right. But Tell me, uh, the track work looks fantastic. What type of track do you use? I do use Atlas Flex Track and I use Pico and Micro Engineering switches. Wow, and when we walked in the room a few minutes ago, you said you you said Siri or Alexa or somebody <laughs> turn on the layout and everything magically went on. Yes, uh, I actually have it hooked up to a Google Home Hub so that I don't have to crawl under the layout and plug things in. So it's, it's hooked up on a, a, a Wi-Fi unit, so all I have to do is tell Google to turn on the train and the other side of it is, is railroad. So uh, since it's on two set, two different power pack units, um, um, one's called train and one's called railroad, and I just tell it to turn on whichever one, and, and it turns it on and off. Likewise. That was amazing. I was impressed. <laughs> and the next thing that you did as soon as it turned it on was you grabbed the throttles, which are mounted here on the side of the right. layout, and this is not your standard DCC, Digitrax, NCE system that I'm used to looking at. What yeah. is this that you run the layout with? Well, everybody knows I'm, I'm a rail pro fan, and uh, I came over from Digitax to RailPro because I got so frustrated with trying to figure out how to speed match and and um, uh, link all, everything together, and, and I just got frustrated because I I had um, Atherin engines that I wanted to to run with with another brand, Atlas or or who knows what, and it just wouldn't do it. And and by the time I got everything speed matched, I would buy a new locomotive, then I'd have to start all over again because it wouldn't fit into the system. And, and Rail Pro automatically does it. So I can run I can run a lifelike with an Atherton if I wanted to because 
they will actually speed match each other automatically. The system, so when you put engines on the track, mm -hmm. the system identifies what they are and it and it makes them run at the same speed so you don't have to get on um, you know, Decoder Pro or anything like that and no. mess with that. No, don't have to have any Decoder Pro, JMRI or anything like that. I find that and, interesting. And, and, and the thing is, the, the way it works is the power for the system is, is brought up through the tracks. The signal to the locomotives is done over the air. So the second, third, fourth, however many locomotives you have synced together, basically it's reading what that first locomotive is doing. And if it gets bogged down, it tells locomotive number two and number three push harder. Okay. So that's the way that basically that, that works. Now I, I could put a battery in a locomotive and run it across the floor if I wanted to. I don't, you know, as long as I have some type of power source in the locomotive, that's all it requires. That's amazing. And I also noticed you had sound on this layout. So mm -hmm. do you use, what kind of sound system? It, it's all RailPro. It, RailPro it, it, sound. It's their, it's their complete system. Now I can take my locomotives to any club. It doesn't matter where they're running plain DC or if they have DCC, Digitrax, NCE, or whatever. Now I can put my train on their tracks and it'll run just fine. Okay. Or I can, use, I can take an NCE controller and I can run my locomotives just like they were equipped with a regular DCC. That's interesting. That's fascinating. That's something we should look into and check out. It sounds very interesting to me. Um, so what we're going to do now is kind of walk around and check out the various parts of your layout. Okay. Well, let's do it. <laughs> so, Campbell, we're standing next to this eight-track yard that you have. Would you call this a staging yard or is this an operation in old yard? Tell me about your design on this. Yeah, this is a full yard. Um, this is, this is a the area where I can put the trains together on this side and eventually over here will be all intermodal. I'll have uh, double intermodal tracks over here with the with everything so that I can bring my intermodal trains in over there and, and put them together and take them apart and this is just general freight uh, classification area here. Now do you, are you going to block all of this and turn off the power or does RailPro allow you to do something with that? It, it's just like DCC uh, unless you program the locomotive it's not going to go anywhere so I don't need to block it off. Everything's powered, everything's hot. I don't have blocks at all. And then this yard's got a diesel facility on the end of it, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And, and a car shop as well. So it's functional. It's functional yes. from the standpoint of you can make up a train. Right. If you wanted to do operation at the same time, you uh -huh. could stage a train for running around for an open house or something like that. Is there anything based, I know this is probably your, your I don't know how many layouts you've had, but you this isn't your first rodeo with building no, a switch yard. No. But is there anything about this now that you've built it that you would have changed? Not yet. I haven't found anything. Of course, I would always like a bigger yard, but you know, it's for, for the amount of cars I have, I don't, I don't go into collecting tons and tons of cars. I don't do tons of locomotive collecting. Um, I keep it at, at a fairly minimum. If I decide I want more, I sell more. Uh, but I, I don't buy a bunch of equipment, so I really don't really need a bigger yard. This is functional for, for what I do. It appears now you're standing near more like a country setting with a lot of trees and scenery, no switching. Just, I feel like I'm going through the countryside. Tell me about this area. Yeah, this was based off an area north of Nashville on the Henderson sub of the CSX. Uh, there was a rock cut where I used to like to rail fan a lot, and I, I always wanted to bring that into my model, so basically that's what I did. Um, this was part of the old uh, layout um, before it was moved up here, and the uh, road that way is basically all new but yeah just a just a general farmland area with a with a rock cut through it i love it the way you've got all the hay rolled up in the balls here just like they do when they're harvesting it and also i noticed you're doing a cornfield working on the cornfield it's it's the bush cornfield and and you have to basically you have to turn every leaf and and everything so it's it's quite consuming and time consuming and a little frustrating every now and then so uh, it's, it's one of those things uh, you, like you have to remind yourself that yeah this is my hobby and I just have to kind of do a little bit each day but uh, yes I'll have a up in the front there I'll have a cornfield and I'm also experimenting with uh, a soybean field by using pipe cleaners and then covering them with uh, knock leaves so that sounds cool that, that's and it looks easier to, to model than corn it looks good man <laughs> the, the ideas are great for countryside so now we're going to yeah. check out your industrial part of the layout all right 
As you've explained to us, your layout's designed so you've got a main line that runs around for, mm -hmm. so you can just run a train. Right. And then the layout is set up in a second section where you can break it up and have an operating train work the areas. And that's part of the area we're standing in front of now, is that right? That's correct. Uh, this is a little uh, four by eight peninsula that's coming out. And I think I redesigned this two or three times is I just didn't seem to have room to do what I want. I originally had a Y in here and uh, that didn't work out real good because I couldn't get all my industries in right. So I ended up kind of coming around and in with, a, uh, with the main and a, and a siding. So when I bring my trains in, I'm allowed, I'm able to place my cars, then run around the train and head it back out to go back to the yard. No, I like this. You've got like an oil industry there. That's one whole set of car cards eventually. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you've got these other different locations, which are complete different spotting locations. And you've got a long track lead that comes into this. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so I can run this as a second railroad, which I, I typically uh, do with uh, uh, I'm, I'm modeling, uh, basically modeling Union Pacific and uh, uh, CN and IC about the merger time. So uh, I can run this as a second railroad if I'd like. The one thing I like is the height of this layout. How high is this built? Got no clue. <laughs> I'm going to guess about 37 inches. Um, I think it's up in the 40 something, uh, 40, 46 to 48, I would, I, I believe. It's a really good height because not only can you see everything overall, you can get to it easily. And, and if I go out in drone photography, I'm usually about two, two to 300 feet above it, which works out scale wise about this height, view, viewing height. So it kind of gives me an idea how to put things together. So now the area we're standing by is part of the yard lead that leads into the industrial area that we mm -hmm. just looked at. And right. this appears to be a grain elevator? Yes, uh, it comes off the main up this way and then comes into my grain area. And um, I have a friend who's, who used to run a feed mill. So he told me all about how to work it and to make it more accurate. And, and he'd always say, you don't have enough tracks. There's not enough room. So. Uh, I wanted to make sure I had enough room to give it as much of an accurate uh, look as possible. So uh, it is, you know, I, I, what, probably 10 foot, foot here. Um, and uh, so that gives me room to get my cars in staged and unload. And yet the, uh, the, the main or whatever comes down beside it. And, and so I still have room to work the cars. I love again how you build your areas and finish a scene first as you go on to, through the layout. What I see here is a lot of static grass that's just well placed and the roads are weathered so beautifully around this grain elevator. Yeah, I, um, you know, I get tired of doing one thing at a time. That's probably why you'll see that a lot of the scenery looks finished in some points and then some points it's not because I'll lay track a while or wire for a while and I'm like, okay, I, I gotta take a break on that. Let's, let's do some scenery because scenery is my favorite part of it. And I enjoy that more than I do running trains. So. Um, I'll take some time and go back in and decide I want to do some scenery and you know everything from uh, individually painted ties that, that I have down here you know it, it takes time to do that but it's the, it's the tension to the little bit of detail that really make the difference and that's what I really enjoy doing the most. The coloring of your walls are beautiful and you also use prototype photographs for your background buildings. Yes, uh, some of them I've purchased, uh, some of them I've taken myself. Uh, the, uh, the Bass Pro Shop that's up here, I, that, that it's like eight or ten photographs that I did, stitched all together and then took it to uh, a printing shop and had them printed on, on, uh, on uh, paper. So that just kind of gives it a little bit of uh, atmosphere. The end result is great. It makes a great looking background for all the freight cars. Thank you. So now we're standing by your river and you've used mm -hmm. a lot of beautiful resin to pour this. You've got a boat ramp. I mean, this is just exactly the way a river looks. What did you, what, how did you come up with the ideas for doing this? I just looked at Missouri rivers and most of them were rock and uh, had a good friend that gave me uh, some good crushed stone. This is the microengineering stone and I, I put down and uh, then the, uh, the resin is actually magic water. Um, I did a lot of research on the different types of uh, waters and um, decided that I wanted to use the magic water, got good reviews, people really liked it, and it didn't get any fading or cracking with it over years, so uh, that's what's here. Um, the colors are great. 
When you say microengineering stone, you're literally talking about a creek that runs right next to microengineering's factory where we've discovered we could sift. I've used it for narrow gauge ballast, but it gives you just the right Merrimack type river coloring of a Missouri river. And at the same time, I see you were using quarry rock to do the filling area of the boat ramp, which is exactly how they would build something like this around here well. Well, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add something a little bit different, so uh, that's what I came up with. No, it's really cool. Another thing I've noticed, and you've created one of the most simple lifts outs. You want to show us how the lift out works? Sure, be glad to. It looks like it doesn't have rail joiners, right? There, there are no rail joiners on e either end of it, and basically it's, it's just a... It's, it's duck, duck underneath it. There you go, it's, it's, it's and go around. So how about that? On the bottom, what I have is I have these these holes and and each one I have pegs so and then I've got power points here so the, all, all you have to do is pick it up and then drop it in and uh, I just wanted something simple and easy that I could get in and out of without having to do rail joiners and things and and um, this is what what I came up with this is awesome Campbell you've built this layout in a very short period of time less than six months I would guess everything seems functional the lift out works the scenery looks good you've got a nice workshop that you work in it's comfortable it's air conditioned I mean this is like not only the best hobby in the world but one of the better layouts that I've seen from the standpoint of simplicity and functionality well thank you that, that means a lot coming from you so um, yeah it's just uh it's all in my head and nothing's planned out on paper and I just kind of go at it by trial and error. It's awesome. Listen, thank you so much for sharing this layout with the viewers of What's Neat, Campbell. Thank you. Glad to. <laughs> all of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado or order online at mycaboose.com.